this is a pretty big topic and it's one that in my opinion does not get talked about nearly as much as it should because i think oftentimes especially with things like social media people are just really spending a lot of time trying to look perfect and happy and awesome all the time anywhere they are online and that frustrates me from a learning point of view if i was a young artist I think that that would be a huge disservice because most of the time artists are not happy and perfect and well-adjusted. Wouldn't you say, Alex? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, And in the realm of mental health, like I remember many conversations I've had with artists in the casual setting where we've even we've even joked of like, so how many days a month do you go to therapy? Like, so what's your antidepressant? Like, it's just an artist thing, I think, or at least that's the stereotype. Yeah. Um, and I think that we were saying earlier that could you find another profession that is more a recipe for disaster when it comes to mental health? I mean, you've got almost nothing going for you. If you're an athlete, yes, I'm sure it's really hard to be an athlete, but at the very least you're in really good physical shape. You're getting all those endorphins working for you. I mean, I don't know that we have anything like that, do we? No, not. We just have like the dark room of the studio, typically isolated. And I'd say like artists and musicians and actors, like in knowing them in my life, it's kind of that thing of we're all riding on that thing that we've used to identify ourselves since we were kids. And then that being on the line for our career is like a recipe for like <laughs> mental health disaster and all that doubt and self worry. And yeah, and you know, we talked about this before too, before we get too far ahead, since we are talking about mental health, I just want to bring up the clear point to everybody watching. Neither of us are mental health professionals. We're talking about our experience with it and inviting sharing. Um, but if anyone watching this is seriously struggling with mental health or knows someone who is, please seek professional help and guidance. Like we're here talking more in camaraderie and support. We are not a supplement to therapy. Absolutely, and thank you so much. Those of you guys who are already in the chat, please jump in and tell us what you think about mental health and being an artist, what you struggle with, what makes things challenging for you, and things you guys would like to have help with. Because I think what makes it very awkward is that it's something that we all struggle with. And yet, why don't people talk about this more? Why is everybody so embarrassed to admit, mm -hmm. hey, this is really freaking hard on me most of the time? I mean, I feel like 1% of my life as an artist is rainbows and sunshine. <laughs> the rest of it is pretty dark <laughs> when I think about it. <laughs> yeah, you know, you mentioned social media, and that's one where I'm actually at the point now where I'm really happy with a solution I've found for the social media and my mental health with my art is because I had this sense, even though my social media was just for art, I only shared art. I pretty much only followed artists. It really gave me in my brain this whole like push and drive thing. Like, how dare you take a day off? Why aren't you sketching? Why aren't you posting? And then I just went ahead and I've taken, at this point, it's been six months, just zero social media. And the thing that I was worried about before that is like, oh, how am I going to keep in touch with artists? How am I going to like stay relevant? And it's fine. It was not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. But I also realized like I have to go back because yeah, like my Instagram is for all intents and purposes, my portfolio. So it still exists. I just haven't logged in. Sorry if anyone's messaged. <laughs> um, so I found a solution that I'm going to do is delete the Instagram app from my phone and only have it on my laptop computer. So it's not so much a constant pressure so that I can still, you know, like take pictures and plan on posting regularly, but it's not as intrusive. Yeah. And Alex, and the world did not end. Your career yeah. did not come tumbling down and crash into nothing. You're still the same person that you were six months ago. I feel yeah. like if anything, you probably have benefited from being oh, off of social media. Yes. And, and even in like a side sense, like that your sense of, or at least for me, my anxiety of 
worst case scenario, of, of course, it, it's anxiety. It's inaccurate. And all of the professionals, art directors or illustrators or clients I've worked with, all of them have like, they were like, oh yeah, this illustrator needed to take like a couple years off for family reasons. That's totally okay. Like the myth we have of like an art director, like crossing your name off the list, being like, they'll never work in this town again. Like that's not realistic. Like we're all people. Not at all. I mean, I feel like the things that will get you crossed off someone's list is if you're overly demanding or mm -hmm. if you misspell their name. That is the type of thing that gets you crossed <laughs> off a list. It's not because they didn't post to Instagram for a week. Oh my God, it's all over. It's not like that. We've got some yeah. comments. Panda Stuff oh. is saying they are working on a series of paintings that relates to their mental health, relating to depression, anxiety, and being a closeted LGBT person. Absolutely. I think that one way that some people have learned to really work through a lot of their mental health is with their own personal artwork. And that's actually something that I came through with a few years ago. I started a project called Falling. I started it in 2010. I worked on it for four years. And it was a hard project for me to work on, not in terms of actually doing it, because I think once I made the decision, okay, I'm going to do it. This is going to be my focus for the next few years. It was no problem. It was the decision to go public with my personal situation. Because you can't make artwork about something as deeply personal as anxiety or depression and be like, yeah, this is based on a friend of mine. <laughs> you can't really do that. Yeah. You have to really be true and honest to the content. And I know for me that was hard to come to terms with, to say, you know what, Clara, you're going to have to tell the whole world that you were depressed for a very long time and that depression is something you continue to struggle with. And once I made peace with that, making the work was not difficult for me. Hamza saying, I think not being able to create what I want is super hard on my mental health. This is mostly because of school, where I'd like to make pieces about my current feelings, but I'm required to draw I'm guessing probably something else. Yeah, and sometimes people will really bother you about making work about mental health. Have you ever seen that in your experience, Alex? Yeah, like um, it's almost, there's a funny thing where it's like people either want too much of it or not enough of it. Like when I think of my memory back in art school, um, there was a problem that I had as a student where I would try to make work that would talk about my emotion, but I was a student. I didn't have the capacity to. And it would then be like a little self-defeating spiral where I would try to, like your series, Claire, is, is masterful. It's beautiful. And then when I think of the stuff that I tried to do when I was like 20 to try to explain my emotion, it just was a swing and a miss, which would then make me more frustrated that I couldn't do it. Well, granted, you didn't have four years <laughs> to work through all of those different <laughs> ideas, but I know you have for to me... Yourself as a creator, you know? Yeah, I think just what convinced me to make that work was that I was diagnosed with depression in my early 30s, and I really had been living with depression for almost my whole life, and I just assumed that's the way the world was. I was like, that's oh, my that personality, that's who I am, and so when I started treatment for the depression, all of a sudden I had this moment where I realized, you know what? That's not me. That is depression. And I'm over here and we are not the same thing. And it was mm -hmm. shocking because I felt like that was the first time I really saw myself clearly. And I thought to myself, I can't not make artwork about this because this is such a seismic shift in my perception of myself that this has to happen. But I'll tell you what was hard is that when I did show the work and it was exhibited in a couple of solo exhibitions and also some group exhibitions, that people really did not want to talk to me about it. They'd always make comments about the technique. They would say things like, oh, I really enjoy your engagement with the materials and I love the way you're doing the darks. Like nobody wanted to touch the subject matter which I understand because maybe you don't want to be talking to somebody you don't know very well about something so personal, but it also was a reminder of how much it is something people don't really want to be talking about all the time. 
Yeah, it became like a, a literal elephant in the room. <laughs> like, yeah, and I, I've had the similar experience with like my work where it's like, oh, what inspired this piece? It's like, oh, like a little bit of like my mental illness inspired this. And then it's like, like <laughs> end of discussion. <laughs> It's like, cool, well, see you later. But it's, I've noticed on the positive side, it's either one of two things. Either, like, and this is, and honestly, Clara, Clara, this is how I felt about your series. When I saw it for the first time, I was like, that's it. That's exactly what it feels like. And it was so perfectly done. I felt this, like, symbiosis between it. And I've had that with my pieces about it, where people are either like, cool, well, good talk. Or they're like, exactly. But like, you know what's interesting, a... Alex, even though people wouldn't speak to me about it like at an exhibition, I cannot mm -hmm. tell you how many emails I got. People oh. writing to me later and students especially saying things to me like, oh, I understand that you know what I'm going through and that's so important to have that be recognized. And so I had some really just lovely messages and conversations one-on-one -on -one with a lot of students that felt really, really good. And so even though there wasn't a lot of public conversation, there definitely were conversations I had that I would not have had normally. Okay, we got stuff in the chat. Ayodeshi oh, cool. is saying they once read an essay on the myth of the tortured artist. They explored how the myth that all great painting comes from a place of pain is detrimental to upcoming and developing artists. Oh, wow. I would love to read that essay, Ayo Deji. You should send that to us. I'm really Cause, interested. Let's see. Because I love that concept. Chris yeah. is saying, we stand for person of color mental health awareness. You are truly a goddess. I don't think about myself as a goddess, but I, I can soak that up <laughs> for a few seconds. I will allow myself to do that. Tammy's saying that she loves my series and 10,000 Crows as well, and that it makes me feel not alone. That's really important because, I don't know, Alex, do, do you get the feeling that artists are trying to hide all the crap? Yeah. Or is this just my perception? Because I feel like every time you go to one of those successful alumni lectures, I get really mad <laughs> because it's oh. like, <laughs> let's pick the two alumni from the past decade who have had smashing success and who are going to all make you feel like crap right now. Let's bring them in to inspire you. And it always has yeah. the opposite effect. People come out of those lectures feeling terrible about themselves. Did and they do that gotta, to you when you were in art school? Yeah. Like, and that's why you've got to just like know yourself. And like, for me, I'm finally starting to know myself in the sense of like, like if I got like, like if I was in like the same town as my alma mater and they were like, hey, like successful artists like reunion meeting, I'd be like, I am not going to that. I'm going to sit in my PJs and watch some cartoons because I know that like as beneficial as that program might be, the way that I'm hardwired in my brain, I would just react negatively to that, you know? And and so I think that's good. But it is, you're hitting at that thing of like the loneliness. It's like you've got to make artist friends. And even if they're not artist friends, like in the same medium, like I've had such good camaraderie with like writers, poets and songwriters. Like I can't play a guitar at period. I don't even know how they work. But like I've had powerful conversations about mental health and art making with a friend of mine who's a musician. You have and, to be with people who understand the struggle because... Yeah. I have been joking around with my students, but now I'm actually thinking we should actually do this, although I know the other faculty would never be on board. I was like, you know what? Instead of bringing in those smashing successful alums, let's bring in some alums who have not had any smashing success, okay? But who are doing something, okay? <laughs> Maybe they've done a few gigs here or there. They're still making their work. They have an okay job. So they're, they're keeping afloat. They have their head above water but they're barely sustaining it. Let's hear from those people, how they live and day to day. That is the so much more realistic. That's, that's how it is. Um, and a lot of it for me was like overcoming that feeling of failure when as far as the population goes, it's like, oh no, you're pretty much on track. Yep. Like <laughs> That's pretty much it. <laughs> barely floating above water. Great job. That's what yeah. people need to be told. But instead they're told, 
oh no, you need to win a Guggenheim by the time you're 23 or you're not relevant. Although my favorite, Alex, I'm sure you can appreciate this. My favorite thing is the 30 under 30 list that Forbes releases every year. Like, dude, if you haven't made it by the time you're 30, you are canceled. Like that is the most, like crap like that just makes you feel like garbage. And I feel like every award out there for artists is to make the other artists feel like garbage. I mean, I feel very ranty right now, but this is exactly what every award makes me feel as I go through this, yep, I suck, remind me again. (laughs) Tell me again who is more successful and better than me. And also, by the way, younger and cuter and thinner, of course. (laughs) Yeah, like, and it's, uh, for me, whenever like I have those, it's like, I always have to like recenter the mind back into like a state of like the gratitude about it. Um, And it sounds so hokey, but it's like, I really mean it. And this really became helpful to me And this is just like, I'm just sharing part of the therapy that helped me get to a more healthy state was seeing like, oh, rather than focusing on like me, like, oh, I couldn't do this. Like I'm not there. My career is not far enough. Instead being like, how stoked like their parents must be, you know, like, oh my God, they made it in the 30 under 30. Oh my God, that's so cool. You know, and using that to fuel like like acknowledgement of a separate journey, you know, again, as hokey as that sounds, just that thing of like, it's a separate journey. Well, you know, it's one of the best parts about getting older is you look Mm. at those 30 year old people, you say, Oh, I'm so proud of you. My former (laughs) students. Good job. And then it's like, fine. But you know, if I were 30, I'd be like, screw that guy. (laughs) When you say former student, I think that's exactly it. Like when I think of like, like there was a student I had when like tutored him in art when he was in middle school and now he's like studying animation. And if flash forward 10 years, that kid wins an Oscar for something, I'm going to be so proud mm-hmm. and have genuinely nothing but gratitude to them. Right. And it's like, that's the thing when like the people who are like, quote unquote, more successful than you, if they're just a vague face, then you're like, that's when envy kind of seeds in. But if it's someone you know, and it's like a person, their journey, then you're like, oh my God, that's so awesome they did that. Exactly. We've got some great comments in the chat. Tammy is saying in their 20s, they suffered terribly with anxiety until I accepted treatment and therapy. Helped me to be who I really was without the anxiety suppressing my true self. That is so well written, Tammy. I think that really sums it up for a lot of people, myself included. And Joshua Daniel is saying the quality of the content on this channel just keeps getting better and better. Thank you so much, you guys. Well, we've been trying really hard to experiment with new content. And I think this is definitely one of those topics that I think everybody thinks about all day, but never wants to talk about, as we mentioned earlier. So, Alex, I actually want to go back to some of your pieces because we have this piece that you did called... I don't know how to pronounce it. Milarepa and the demon. I, th- I don't know how to pronounce it either. It's Milarepa, I think. <laughs> okay. Anyway, it's a yeah. gouache painting. And by yeah. the way, if you guys want to learn how to do gouache, I highly recommend that you check out Alex's gouache painting tutorial. I'm in it too, but I'm only there to ask questions because as, I don't as, understand as I... gouache. And Alex is here like, you just do this. this. I'm like, stop. I don't understand. So if you want to watch me do that, I'm in this tutorial as well. But Alex, talk to us about this piece, because this is a real almost outlier in a lot of your other pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, So first I want to like in two seconds, the story behind it, it's like a a short Buddhist story of like there was Melaropa. I'm super white. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, But he was a monk meditating in a cave. And all of a sudden, a slew of demons appeared all around him. And he just looked at them and, you know, essentially was like, well, this is my life now. Okay. And then they all disappeared except for one, the like fiercest of all the demons. And he said, well, I guess this is it. And he surrenders to the demon and sticks his head in its mouth. And only when he does that, does the demon disappear. And so all of my work, I do like, you know, book illustration and story illustration. And so when I read that for the first time, I was like, oh, dude, that's exactly like what my solution for depression and anxiety was, was just surrender to it. But I think the most important thing about this piece was that it was just, it still is just a personal piece for me. 
I didn't submit this to any competitions or award programs. Like I didn't send this out through mailers or in my portfolio. Like this piece was to me purely personal and that's it. And I like, I sent this one to you because I wanted to talk a little bit about that importance of like, for me, the most helpful thing with mental health was remembering to still make personal work. Like not just like personal work, like you're going to put it in your portfolio, but personal work where it's like, nope, this is just for me to help me through this. Wasn't you know? that incredibly liberating, Alex? It felt so good. Like, and that's why it's like, I still have it like hanging up in my home because it's just like, I'm still happy with that process of it, you know? Well, Alex, I want to compare this against some of your commission pieces, because I know that you did have this client who commissioned a number of posters. So we have this one, Meadow Mountain, which is of a moose. And we have this other one, which is Cape Cod with a lobster. And if you yeah. guys want to develop an inferiority complex about gouache, I invite <laughs> you to look at this detail. And yes, we all feel like garbage now. Thank you very much, Alex, for painting uh, yeah. like that. But I just want to talk about the difference because I don't know about you guys, but this lobster piece is in a totally different galaxy than this illustration. I would love to yeah. hear in the chat what you guys think is different between this illustration, this personal piece versus this commission piece. Because for me, it is light years apart. We've got more comments in the chat. Panda Steph is wondering, do art teachers ever feel jealousy towards exceptional students? Of course we do. What do you think I'm doing with Alex right now? <laughs> like, <laughs> Alex, I never want to pick up gouache because of you. I mean, it's not really story. jealousy as much as it is acceptance. You're just mm -hmm. like, yep, Alex is a much better painter well, than me. Okay, I accept it. Move on. <laughs> That's wait. the attitude you have to take because if you teach at an art school, you're gonna have students that are so much better than you. I mean, I've had students in classes turn in stuff and they're like 18 and I'm like, yeah, I can't do that. You could ask me right now, I could not do that. <laughs> so that's Even gonna happen. Prof, having like people submit their portfolios to us to critique in art prof and they're like, yeah, I'm just a like junior in high school. This is my portfolio. And we're like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> like what's wrong with you? <laughs> But, well, Alex, but if this I, makes you feel any better, I did a portfolio yeah. critique for somebody today who was 14 years old, entirely mm. self-taught, only from YouTube, who submitted a portfolio that honestly was like as good as people who are applying to art school right now. And so actually cool. said to me <laughs> in the statement, I want to know how am I doing for my age? I was like, dude you rock. <laughs> I'm like, you're amazing. And so that's where it is helpful to get that perspective. Okay, yeah. let's see. Sylvana Morel is saying this is relatable. It's actually sad people don't want to talk about something can happen to them if haven't at any point in life. Empathy is important. Panda Stuff is saying the commission piece feels more robotic, less personality and individuality, while the illustration definitely feels more personal. I would agree. I mean, for me, just looking at the pieces quickly, this piece is so dynamic and fluid. It keeps moving. The colors are so luscious. And I feel like this, the lobster, as much as I'm like fawning over the technique, it's a very controlled piece. Like you mm -hmm. really are trying to dictate every single stroke. And I feel like in a lot of ways, the other illustration is not remotely as detailed. And I don't feel like you're showing off your technique as much in this illustration, but it's mm -hmm. almost like you don't have to because the visuals and the essential design of the piece carry it in a way that maybe the lobster piece does not so much. Even though, yes, I like worship the ground Alex walks on in terms of gouache painting techniques. Yeah. So <laughs> let's look at some of your other pieces, Alex, because you have these other illustrations. Like we're looking at this Frankenstein piece that you yeah. did in pencil. Was this a commission piece? It was, I'm glad we're bringing this one up because the Frankenstein is a good middle ground between something that's purely inspired by um, like my own narrative and then things that's commissioned. So the lobster was commissioned and the my client was saying like, essentially, like, I wanted this size. I wanted to say Cape Cod on the top. I wanted to have a lobster and I want it to be blue in the background. And it's like, boom. So it's like, I was just like, cool, I'm just going to execute it. 
But for the Frankenstein one, spoiler alert for people who haven't read Frankenstein yet. <laughs> um, like it's the scene when the monster kills uh, Frankenstein's wife on the wedding night. Um, and to me, I wanted to illustrate that scene and it's inspired by like me having like night terrors and panic attacks, um, like waking up in the middle of the night. And so that's an example where, but that piece then is in my portfolio and it's part of a series I did for like illustrating like middle grade young adult books. And so that's an example of like using my personal narrative to fuel something that is professionally based. Whereas the lobster would be an example of like purely professional based. Right. You like, weren't <laughs> really getting anything out of this creatively speaking. I mean, I'm sure I gave you a run for the money in terms of the gouache painting part, but yeah, that's yeah. a lot more technically based. And then you also have these other pieces like this illustration the scarlet kimono found this is another gouache painting was this one also similar to the frankenstein illustration that one is more similar to the lobster actually where that one like there was zero emotional like that was an illustration for a series i did on murder on the orient express by agatha christie and this piece like i'm really proud of it it won like an international award and I think a big reason that it did <laughs> is because there's no emotional thing behind it mm. I did a scene and I wanted to illustrate it and I spent so much time and focus on the composition the color and setting up the scene well whereas even when I'm thinking of like the Melaropa or even the Frankenstein one I think a lot of the time I allocated to them was for how do I kind of metaphorically communicate my personal communication through it does that make sense yeah for sure so, yeah in that way of like it's beautiful and wonderful and necessary to like share your emotions through your work but you also have to kind of like check and be like wait it's still got a it's still got a mow the lawn you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and then we also have this macbeth illustration was this one also similar in a way closer to the frankenstein and that one was when we were talking about when you said people would send you the emails about sharing with their experience, uh, the Macbeth, it was just similar to Frankenstein. It's illustrating a scene from Macbeth for a portfolio, but there's a line where it says full of scorpions is my mind. And again, it was also like replicating like in art, what a panic attack felt like to me. And I think that line from Shakespeare felt so powerful when I read it in that context. And that one sold at a gallery show I had and the person who bought it, like they were like, dude, this reminds me of when I've had anxiety attacks. And I was like, high five, bro. That's exactly <laughs> <laughs> like, so it's, that's why I wanted to talk about that one a little bit because it's that, yeah, that kind of thing of like, it's not, that's not all about me. It's about Macbeth, but the subtext in there is my personal narrative that wanted to fuel it. In the chat, Sylvana is saying, for me, the difference is one is lighter in color. It doesn't round out the elements in black lines, so it makes it look realistic. Amazing work. And Sylvana mm -hmm. is also saying, Alex, please give me just a little bit of your talent. Yeah, seriously, Alex, why can't you just like give it out? You know, I, I could really use a little some right now. But I also <laughs> think what's really challenging is like, I know we're all sort of drooling over Alex's paintings all the time, but the thing is, it's like, your work is so freaking good. And yet a lot of people would look at your paintings and say, oh my God, you're so good. Like you must be like totally, you know, getting all these deals and da 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 da. And it's like, oh my God, if somebody who has this kind of technique and is producing this type of work is still struggling, I mean, it, it's like, really, really art fields? That's how you're gonna do it? Because I have a friend who works in academia, she's a psychology professor, and I once was explaining to her all of the problems that we go through, because I think it's a lot of things. For example, and I'm gonna show you guys, we have a couple of videos that explain this. I think just dealing with the sheer amount of rejection is horrific as an artist. Mm. And that alone, I'm not even talking about no motivation or confidence or anything, just getting all those rejections over and over again it's enough to just destroy your self-esteem as an artist. And so, Alex, tell them that regardless of your skill set, you have experienced lots of rejection. What has that been like? 
Oh, yeah. Uh, so did I ever tell you the first conversation I had with an agent? No. What was it? Oh, it's great. Like, it, it, if this doesn't just put like, like I just melted into my shoes. So it was at my first illustration conference. And this agent gave a talk. And they said that they worked out of the same town that I was living in. So I went up, I'm being super vague here. <laughs> but I went up to this agent. And afterwards, and I was like, Oh, hi, like, I just wanted to say like, thanks, it was insightful. Like, Here's uh, like my card with my information. Like we're from the same area. I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee when we're back in town. And they just looked at me and said, oh, you're from the same town? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, so? And walked away. <laughs> and it was just like, oh. <laughs> um, but, and then it's like, but it like that wasn't like ice cold. It's like for them, they were a person. They had just finished giving a talk. They were like personed out. They needed their me time. And it was like, Oh, I got to go. And it's like, that's that thing of like, if I had let that like fester and been like, or like, that's like another case of rejection. Instead, you just have to like, take it and be like, it just wasn't the right place, right time, you know? Actually, and then you just Alex, the, the rejections that I think drive me more crazy are the ones that are just so useless. Because in art school, I get a lot of students who complain a lot about, oh, well, that critique I had was so frustrating because the professor didn't like anything and they talked about this, this, and this. And I'll say to them, yes, that's frustrating, but you know what's worse is when it's crickets. Nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, people don't even acknowledge that you exist. Like, that is so much more painful. Or, this is my favorite, I had this pretty high-up curator who came to my studio for a visit, and I had this huge sculpture installation that I had made. I had to set it up. It took forever and ever and ever. I brought them into the room. This is exactly what happened. They looked at it and said, I don't care for this at all. That was it. I was like, yeah, thanks. Great. And that's <laughs> like, I talk to people who are like in art school. It's like, dude, I, like what I wouldn't give for like an hour segment where like a room full of people are just telling me what's wrong with the piece. Oh, I like, would that's love it. I would eat it up. I'd be like, you're paying attention to me. Thank you. <laughs> and I guess this comes from the file too of like your anxiety makes it so much worse than it really is. Like about rejection. Like think of the job of an art director at a big publishing house. They get daily <laughs> stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of postcards and mailers and samples of work that they can't even. So it's like if some if you send out your mailer and nobody responds at all. It doesn't mean you're a failure. It just means that yours was part of thousands on someone's desk on that very day. So keep sending them. Keep sending it along. One of the days it's just going to hit and it's going to work. But you have to be patient. And if someone does respond but says no, keep that in mind too. They took time out of their insanely busy day to not just like brush you aside, but to actually say, essentially in between the lines, they're saying, you got chops, like fix these things, and then we'll talk. Let's see, 10,000 Crows is asking, did you enjoy creating the pieces that you weren't emotionally attached to? Often I think I should only create something if I have an emotional attachment to it, but I think maybe that is limiting me. Mm. I think it became, and it's funny, we talked about this, I think in the last YouTube live we did of like the need to practice. And I think for the gouache, or they're all gouache, <laughs> but for the lobster one, I was just executing. I was just like making the piece. So I'm not even kidding. I was like sometimes like watching movies while I painted that or listening to podcasts or like I would even bring the whole painting into the living room and just hang out with my roommates while I painted it because that's all I had to do. Whereas for like the Melaropa one, which is almost entirely personal, I was just like, all right, let's just do it. And so as far as enjoyment goes, let's put this, <laughs> I didn't enjoy the process of Melaropa more, but it was more fulfilling. So that's, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And I think it varies from person to person, 10,000 Crows, because I literally did one illustration job and said, I hate this. I'm done. <laughs> I cannot do commission work. I am terrible at it. When I was a lot younger, I did do a couple portrait commissions because I thought that maybe that would be a way to combine income with my practice, but I hated every minute of it. And I just, I was like, I can't do this. Like I would rather 
work as a construction worker to make money in something completely unrelated than to be doing something that in theory I love, but yeah. I'm being forced to just hate every minute of. Like to me, that hurts so much more than doing something completely unrelated. And so that's why for me, teaching is a really good solution because teaching is my bread and butter. And so therefore, in terms of my fine arts practice, I don't have anybody telling me what to do. I never do commissions. I really am not somebody who works that way. I mean, maybe if somebody asked me to do a commission and they want to pay me $50,000, I would think about it. But it's not in my blood to work that way. Alex, I think you're a lot better at the commissions than I am. I just can't <laughs> even go there. I'm, a, I'm slightly, but not a lot. In fact, I, what you just said resonated a lot with me. Where That's why I've never quit my day job, like pardon the joke, is because I love having that freedom to be able to like say, no, like I don't want to take that job. Like um, I, I think one story a professor said was like, and similarly he wor worked as a teacher so he was able to turn down jobs where he remarked for once that Camel, the cigarette company, wanted him to do an illustration for them. And he declined because he's morally against smoking because I guess it kills people. Um, but like, and it's important to note, by the way, he didn't send them like a scalding, like, no, how dare you? Da, 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 Cause that's just mean. Um, but he did politely decline. Um, and yeah, so I think that thing of notice if you're, you work best that way too. Like I know like peers of mine who were just like, they view it like this. We're like, okay, so rent costs this much. Gross meats costs this much. I need to make this much money every month. And I'm only going to make that through art. And they do it and they knock it out of the park. And they've got like more hustle than Beyonce. And it's awesome. And if you're that kind of person, go for it. But if you're the kind of person like me, who's a little bit more like hobbit oriented in the way I like to live my life, then the coziness of like a day job is invaluable. Well, to give me that, like, I don't have to stress about it. And I also want to point out that this is not limited to the 21st century, because actually one of my favorite artists who I looked at a lot for my Falling series was Franz Xaver Messerschmitt. And yeah. if you've never seen his sculptures before, what I think is really startling about these, don't these look like contemporary sculptures? I mean, these are from the 18th century. That's crazy to me because they do not look like the artwork of that time period. But I was doing some research on Messerschmitt for my Falling series, and basically he did the series of these character heads. It really was a point in his life, 1770, when his mental health deteriorated because one of his primary professional champions, who was like the director of the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts, actually died, and that's when everything just burned up for him. He got passed over for a professorship, basically did not get tenure. Seriously, that's enough to like put anybody in a complete tailspin. But then basically he felt totally humiliated by that experience and he stopped getting commissions and he died in poverty basically alone. And so being an artist, he's known today, but I mean, isn't the quintessential cliche is Vincent van Gogh? He's the stereotypical artist who did not do well during his lifetime. And yet now he has these pieces that are selling for millions of dollars. But I do think that there is an inherency to the way the artist's life is set up that just is not good for your mental health. <laughs> because we were talking earlier, okay, so you have all the vocational struggles. You also have the issue with all the rejection. But I also think a lot of being a good artist is confidence. If you don't have confidence in yourself as an artist, it's very hard to get any traction and also how to stay motivated because mm -hmm. we don't have people telling us exactly what to do. If I'm a swimmer, hmm, what am I going to do tomorrow? I think I'm going to swim, right? And for us, it's not that well defined. So yeah. I think there's a lot of challenges going on. We've got some comments in the chat. Ramiro wants to know, at what point did you know or decide that it was time to pursue art as a vocation? Was it a confidence thing? Was it finishing school, accepting enough critiques? Alex, I'm mm -hmm. going to have you do that one. That's a great one. Um, so I think 
part of my narrative I have to talk about right now is like I'm in the process of going back to school, not to quit art, but to get another day job, essentially. Like, and so viewing art, I love that that comment used the word vocation, where it's like, I want the art is never going to stop being my vocation. In fact, like the turning point for me in 2020 is that I'm going to start doing more personal work. Um, like, because with going back to school, I can't hustle as much to get freelance work, but I of course don't want to stop. So I'm going to focus on just like, cool. Now I can make work that like, isn't trying to get a job. <laughs> it's just going to be vocational. You know? I mean, I bet that was a huge lift off your shoulders because I don't know about those of you who are watching, but the hustle is exhausting. Having to mm -hmm. constantly prove to people, hey, I'm worth it. Hey, I'm responsible. I mean, I am 43. I've been in this field for a very long time. I'm pretty established and I'm hustling all the time, every single day. And I had this day yesterday. It was one of those I'm going to shoot off 50 cold call emails just for fun. Let's see. Of course, crickets. And I think, oh, no, I did get one reply. Somebody told me, thanks, I'm going to pass. <laughs> yes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> exactly. So I think that it's, it's very hard. And I don't mean to say that we have solutions for any of you. But Alex, I think what you had said earlier about making sure this is something you talk about with people, even if you don't feel that you can talk about it in a public situation, talk to people on the phone. Because I actually had this former student who I had been following on Instagram for a while. And I remember based on looking at their Instagram posts, thinking, oh my God, they are hitting it out of the park. Like they were just doing amazing work and posting all the time. And then I talked to them later on the phone and they said, Oh my God, Clara, I'm so depressed. And I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, but the work you're doing is like incredible. They're like, oh my God, I can't get a job. I'm living at home. I'm so mad about this, this, and this. And so it really can be that dramatically different from reality. Yeah. And I also know that when professional artists give lectures, okay, so if somebody asks me, okay, Clara, we want you to come do a visiting artist lecture and stuff like that. I do not talk about stuff like that. I don't tell students about how difficult it is because that's not really what they want you to do at an artist lecture. Mm -hmm. They want you to talk about all of your successes, everything that went well. And I wish that would change. I don't think it will anytime soon, but I think that the lecture that I know really does have an impact on my students is the one I give on the last day of class when I just, put it all out there. I'm like, this sucked. I hated my 20s. People told me I was nothing. I was told I was a bait. I, I just tell everybody, it's like totally unfiltered. And mm -hmm. it's a little bit embarrassing for me to give that lecture, but I cannot tell you how many students come up to me later and say, Clara, I'm so glad you told me that because now yeah. I know that there's not something wrong with me. That was a very real thing. Um, and it's like, it's funny how the conversation went full circle when you were talking about like how like say like how like the mixed feelings of like someone in a 30 under 30 list. But then you hear and it's like when you give a visiting lecture talk, you have to give that 30 under 30 kind of vibe. You know, you have to be like, oh, I am a success. That's, that's why you wanted me to talk here today. You know, so it's a funny that's another thing to keep in everyone's mind too, of just like those successful artists that you're following and wanting to be like, like they are struggling too. Like, you know, nobody has an easy street on this, you know? No. And most of us do not post our crappy artwork because mm -hmm. we feel like it's sort of embarrassing. I try to do it every now and then just to say to people, guess what guys, I made a crappy drawing today. Oh wait, I made three. I just tried to do that. But the expectation is not that you're going to show that as your main public face. But I do it every now and then because I don't care. And number two, because I think younger artists need to see that. Okay, we have a couple more questions in the chat. We'll try to get to them. Uh, so let's see. Fer Fern Sins is saying, I'm working on a portfolio. I only have half the required amount of pieces. I'm running out of time. Any tips for staying strong and not stressing? I would say, for instance, put in some really good podcasts, drink some coffee and have some fun 
<laughs> that's the right. only way you can approach it at this point because <laughs> you're not going to get more time at this point. Stadius is asking, is social function of art provocations of new self-descriptions in society? Um, I don't know that I understand that sentence. I'm guessing it might be a translation issue. So I'm sorry, Thaddeus, I can't answer that. And Denny Louise is saying, how can we separate our self-worth from how, quote, good our art is? What do you yeah. think, Alex? I'm so glad that you asked that question, because that's like cutting to the heart of this whole issue. Like, just as you are not your depression or your anxiety, like you are not your art either. Like your art is a thing you do. Like the times when I feel the most myself are not when I'm painting, but when I'm biking with no hands, like that's when I feel the most Alex, you know, and just know, like, keep those things in mind for yourself of like, this is something I do that I'm very good at. Like I have a passion for, but this is not the only thing I'm interested in. Like if you start to feel that way, like make a list I'm just a list person. They help me make a list of other things that bring you like unparalleled joy, like going to live music shows or hiking or like other things that define you and keep those in mind and your arts. Then it starts to look a lot less intimidating to you. You know, I had a professor in school who said, make your art part of your life. Don't make your life part of your art. And I think Work. that yeah. is a pretty good way to balance things. I hope yeah. you guys will explore our other related videos, like five reasons you're being rejected as an artist, how to gain confidence, and how to stay motivated. If you guys want to continue to grow as an artist, I recommend subscribing to our channel and ringing the bell to make sure you don't miss out on anything. And thank you to our top supporters who make all of this possible. You guys keep the lights on. Keep us going. Thank you so much for all coming to the stream and we'll talk to you next time. Bye.